Well, good morning. I don't know if I've ever listened to that song very closely before. Singing about how the two things that we confess are both our worth and our unworthiness. We have immense worth in Jesus Christ. As we said before, our value, the value that something is worth is what somebody is willing to pay. And God paid for us with his son. So we have immense worth. But at the same time, we all hold in, in intention our own unworthiness. We recognize our sin. I love the fact that we, that Sarah, you called a redo to start. I think there are times when, when we all need just a redo in our week, in our days, and how we interact with people. And I'll confess that I'm, I feel that a little bit today. In our pre-service meeting, we talked about, well, Van asked me, like, how was your week of preparation? And I had to admit that I was, I was glad that I wasn't preaching on last week's sermon about submitting, you know, loving my wife well. I'd like to have a redo on that week. And certainly even as I think of what we're going to look at today here in Ephesians chapter 6, there's a redo that can happen there as well at times. And so it's nice to know that even in our unworthiness that we still have great worth in Christ. So, so thank you. Thank you for starting off our service uh, in that way. Can I pray just to get us going? Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place, to pay the penalty of our sin, to give us new life. That you have said that there is nothing that we could ever do or say Nothing that could ever interfere with your love for us. That we do have such great worth because of Christ. And you know, God, we recognize in our, in our sinfulness that well, we don't understand it. We don't understand. We recognize how unworthy we can be at times. So help us to not stay in that, but to fix our eyes upon you and to live into this, this life that you've called us to. And even as we look at that today, as we open up your word, God, I pray that that, that would be true, that we would, that we would see this high calling that you have for us, this different, this new, this radical way of living, that we would live into that. And, and Father, I certainly know, I recognize that as much as I'm up here to speak these truths to the church, that I am speaking these truths to myself and my own heart. And that I need this. So transform me. Transform us. Make us more like your son. So speak to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please open them up to Ephesians chapter 6. And we are going to look uh, at a, a couple relationships in which we are called to live differently. Differently. 
If you have your notes, uh, you'll have some of this, uh, where, some spots where you can jot some of this stuff down, but it bears repeating stuff that we've said every week in terms of, of this, this sermon series out of Ephesians. Um, but here we are in chapter 6. It's the second part of this book. We're in this second part. And it's this part here where Paul is giving us instruction on how we are to live out our Christian faith. And in this second part, uh, we have learned already that we are to live in unity with one another, that we are to put away our old self, our old life, and we are to walk in holiness. This means that our, that our speech is going to be different. The words that we say, the jokes that we tell will be different. Our behaviors will be different. We shouldn't be sexually immoral or greedy. If you remember, Paul didn't just say, don't do this anymore, but he said, don't do this and replace those old things with new ways of living. Replace lying with telling the truth. Replace stealing with working hard and sharing. Replace unwholesome talk with with praise and blessings and, and words that build up others. We're to replace bitterness and anger and fighting with kindness and compassion and forgiveness. We learn that we're supposed to be allowing the Holy Spirit to, to empower us to live this Christian life. All of this really is, it's a call to a new radical way of living. And it's a lifestyle to be sure that would make a person stand out in a secular culture. But all of this is doable because of everything that was talked about in the first half of the book, in the first three chapters, that we are motivated to live this life because all that God has done for us and all that he's still doing uh, for us and through us through the work of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's in that first half of the book, we saw that, that God has blessed us in Christ. He chose us. He called us. We are his inheritance. He adopted us into his family. We have been forgiven and redeemed uh, from our sin. We have hope and we have his power working through us. And all these things... These wonderful things are highlighted by the fact that, that Gentile Christians, people like you and me, have equal standing with, with Jewish believers. That we have equal standing with God's chosen people. That we're not just outsiders looking in, but we are, we are a part of the family. And it's in Jesus that we have this worth that we just sang about. It's in Jesus that we have been brought into a brand new family, that there's no division or distinction in God's family. And so that's the context as we're coming into this here at the first part of chapter 6, that we're continuing to look at what relationships should look like in the Christian life. And we're picking up where we left off last week, And last week, if you remember, Greg took us through the end of chapter 5. And in it, in chapter 5, we saw that the life of a believer, a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning someone who is allowing the Holy Spirit to control and empower every aspect of their life, a Spirit-filled believer's life is marked by mutual submission to one another out of reverence for Christ. As Ephesians 5.21 says, that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And it's from there that, that Paul springboards into three illustrations of what submitting to one another looks like. And he uses three different relationships. And Greg took us through the first one last week, the marriage relationship. 
that wives are called to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. And then husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So I'm not going to reiterate everything that Greg said last week. I did a really fine job doing that. And if you missed it, I encourage you to go to our website and check it out. Besides the fact that I don't want to say anything that will get me in trouble. I, I, I'm probably pretty well prone to do. But, but the Bible is clear that what we need to do. And we as believers need to decide if we're going to listen and obey or act as if we somehow know better because certain words like submit and obey and everything else don't sit well with our modern sensibilities. I will say this as, as we get ready to look into these next sets of relationships. And I think it's true with any relationship, not just in marriage or the two that we're going to talk about today, but probably the biggest obstacle that a lot of us have in submitting to one another or submitting to another person in general, the biggest obstacle is fear. We fear that the other person will somehow manipulate us or mistreat us or or take advantage of us. We're called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, out of worship and respect for him. See, in Jesus, there is no need to fear. His commands are for our benefit and for his glory. And although he really could come at us with, with raw authority, you need to do this and be strong and harsh about it, He doesn't do it with dominance. Jesus is tender and gracious. And and that's how we should should be approaching, submitting to one another. So again, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to look at these uh, next two sets of relationships where we're called to submit to one another. So if you, don't want, if you want to follow along with me as I read these, these nine verses, um, we'll go from here. So it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction in the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as, you were, as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. So as we look at uh, these next two sets of relationships that, that Paul is using to illustrate how we are to submit to one another, um, I'll say there are several common themes among the, these three examples. Um, there's not a place in your notes to write this down, so these are just some freebies that uh, you get based on my observations this week. But first of all, All three of these groups, all three of these relationships contain a weaker and a stronger member. Or to put it differently, somebody who has authority and and status and somebody who does not. Second observation is that all six of the, the people addressed 
the wives and the husbands, the children, the, the fathers and parents, the slaves and the masters. All six of these positions, as they submit to one another, reflect something of the nature and character of Jesus. And the third thing is that as Paul writes this, uh, he includes with all three relational groups something that is a motivating factor as to why they should live this life that they're called to. And then he gives some instruction as to how or what submission in that role actually looks like. And so if you are taking notes, um, you have some spots in there to, to write down these motivations and these instructions in it. So let's take a closer look at uh, these relationships here in chapter 6. So it starts with children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. First one is children and parents. So two notes, two side notes here again that I, I want to point out with this. Uh, he's addressing children directly here in this first bit. So it's safe to say that the children were actually in the church setting with their parents. So now this isn't necessarily a mandate that children need to be in the service with them. Of course, it's great, and we encourage that here. It's good to have our kids in the service with this. Um, but it's still okay to have age-appropriate program for kids. Um, so this isn't necessarily that mandate that kids have to be there. But there is that assumption that kids are part of the body and that kids are able and, and should be learning to do the right things. A second side note is that children could mean children of any age. Young children in the home and adult children as well. Now, certainly culturally, uh, that would be true, that, that it's true that parents had authority over their adult kids. Uh, and in context, though, I'd, I'd say that this is probably leaning more toward the younger kids. But there is an element um, where it's fitting for adult children to be listening to and obeying their parents as well. But we'll talk about more of that in a little bit. But it starts by saying, children are to obey. I don't know about you, whenever I hear that word obey, I think of Bill Cosby where he says, obey sounds like pig Latin. Obey, obey. Like, like my name is Tevensay. This is obey. So, I don't know. Weird way I think. Um, but this is, this is an interesting command because certainly there, there's no one in any culture at any time throughout history who would ever suggest that children should not obey their parents. So why then does it need to be stated here that, you know, all right, children, you need to obey. I think part of it goes to, if you're, you're reading this and understanding this in context of all of Paul's writings, there are two other occasions in Romans 1 and 2 Timothy 3 where Paul gives a long list of fruits of godlessness. And right in the middle of those lists of, of ungodly traits, you'll find the phrase, disobedient to parents. And that's in Romans 1, 2 Timothy 3. So disobedient to parents is thrown right in there with people who are greedy, people who are boastful and proud, people who are abusive and ungrateful, unforgiving, slanderous, and several other things. And the point is that when this happens, when children disobey their parents, when people turn away from God, this is, when people turn away from God, this is what happens. Children start disobeying parents. Rather than submitting to him and to them and living as God designed it, people rebel and live according to their own plan. 
And they certainly don't listen to their parents. And in both of those passages that I referred to, Paul says that one of the features of a decaying culture is the breakdown of the family, where children, res- where children should be respecting and obeying their parents gets thrown out the window. So when it comes to children, the way that they are, are showing a mutual submission to one another is that they would be submitting to and obeying their parents. And there are three motivations in this. The first one is, is just simply that it's right. Uh, to me, it, it's similar to the way that Paul writes in uh, chapter 5, verse 3, where he's saying immorality and impurity and greed are improper. You know, he's, he's pretty blunt about it. He's blunt here, like, you obey just because it's right. There's no asterisk here. You know, there's a similar list of what children should do in, uh, in, in relationships as well in Colossians chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 20, it says, children should obey in everything. Again, it's, there's no asterisks in this. He's not saying do it if it's convenient or obey when you feel like it. He's saying obey in everything. So kids, do your chores, right? All, all my parents in here agree? <laughs> Do your chores without being told. Do your homework. Turn off your devices. Turn off your lights when you leave a room for crying out loud. I mean, obey your parents. It's the right thing to do. Generally, they know what's best. So the motivation, one of the motivations in there is just that it's right. Second motivation is that it's commanded. It says, goes from children, obey your parents in the Lord, to honor your father and mother. And this is echoing the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments. You can find that in Exodus 20, verse 12, and Deuteronomy 5, 16. Honoring your parents takes obedience to a whole nother level, right? You know, we can do things that our parents tell us to do without having the right attitude about it, right? So we can all go out and take the trash out because we're told to, but be grumbling and, and cursing our parents under our breath. That's obeying, but it's not necessarily honoring them. It's kind of like when Jesus said, you, know, you have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But I say, don't hate somebody. Or that you, you know, shouldn't commit adultery. But I say, don't have lust. It's really not just the act of obedience that is the right thing to do, but it's, it all starts in the heart. It all starts with how we are responding. So it's right, it's commanded, and it has benefits. It's the third motivation. That It says that this is the first commandment with a promise, so so that it will go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Obedience leads to a better life. That it will go well. Disobedience offers no hope of a better life or a better quality of life 
There's no promise for a good life if you're going to live in rebellion. And certainly disobedience doesn't give you hope for a long and prosperous life. In fact, disobedience often leads to the type of life that is destructive and the types of lifestyles that often result in a shortened life. Now, is this saying that obedience is a guarantee that somebody's going to have a long life? Well, certainly not. Not in that sense. Because, well, one, if that's the case, I, we've all disobeyed our parents. And so if this was, in a sense, the type of promise that was a one-to-one -one correlation, none of us would be here at this point. And certainly as a person who has lost a child at a young age, it doesn't jive with who God is and, and what he has promised that, that my son's death was, in a sense, due to his disobedience. And that's not the case here. But the promise in here is that in our obedience, that we are, are given a quality of life and a, and, and a directional life that sets our life up for good things. That it's, the disobedience sends you down in one direction, but the obedience sends you in another direction. Certainly, I, I, there's, there's probably m much more eloquent ways to be putting this. You know, and it does say that this is the first commandment with a promise. Now, there, there are a lot of uh, debate in terms of really what that means. Because uh, if actually, if you look at the second commandment in the Ten Commandments, that there's, there is a promise associated with that as well. So what is Paul getting at in this? And there's, there's a variety of different ways to be looking at and thinking about this, but the way that seems to make sense in terms of the context of that is, is one of two ways. One could be just the, it's the first commandment in the sense that a parent would be teaching a child that they need to be listening to it. And that when a child learns to obey that's generally the first thing that we as parents are teaching them. Or another way of looking at it could be that in the list of the ten, where the first four commandments are, are more in relationship to God and our, and our worship and, our, and how we view him, starting with the fifth commandment, that's the first one in relationship to how we interact with people. And so that would be the first commandment uh, that has a promise in terms of how we interact and how life would be here in, in relationships. But the motivations in here are, are pretty clear. That our, our children should obey because it's right, and because it's commanded, and that there are benefits to this. But there's an instruction that comes along with that. And it's found in, in just in that little phrase, in the Lord. Now the phrase, in the Lord, is not modifying the parents. You're not just supposed to be obeying parents that are in the Lord. That's not what in the Lord is getting to. But in the Lord refers to the verb of obey. And to, to how we are to obey. Children are carrying out their Christian duty by obeying their parents. That we are showing our, submi our submission to Christ and our submission to our parents. It's a model of Christ's humility and his obedience to the Father. And so that children should be obeying in the Lord. 
So again, it's not saying that you're just to obey Christian parents. And similarly, it's not implying that you can disobey your parents who are not believers. So that even if your parents are unbelievers, that we can still obey them as part of our reverence and our worship in the Lord. Now we'll talk about in just a second of really what that means in terms, because obviously sometimes our parents ask us to do things uh, that aren't right. And so we'll talk about that in just a second. But, But that's one half of the equation regarding children. That their act of submission and reverence to Christ is to obey their parents. But then the next verse addresses fathers. Uh, certainly in that culture, fathers bear the, the primary responsibility of raising the kids and, and leading them in the ways that they should go. But it doesn't get, let mom off the hook with this. So moms, you've got to listen to this too. Uh, all this easily applies to moms and dads as parents. But it does address the father specifically. And it says, do not exasperate, I always say that, ask, I don't know, exasperate your children. It starts with something there to avoid. Some of our translations say, do not provoke your children to anger. In other words, we as parents, specifically we as fathers, Shouldn't it be condescending to our children? We shouldn't antagonize them. We shouldn't embitter them. We don't need to do things that we know will frustrate them. Because this is not how God treats us. It's not helpful to the child at all. It's not treating them with the dignity and respect that they deserve, especially for our Christian children, as equals in Christ, to be treating them in such a way that they become embittered or frustrated. And it's certainly not appropriate to be treating somebody, provoking somebody to anger who is an image bearer of God. So we're to avoid the type of behavior as parents that would have this kind of response by our children. And so what does that mean? What, is, what does it look like to, to provoke our children to anger, to exasperate them? Well, here's just a, a short list that I came up with, probably because these are all things that I've done at various different times in my own parenting. We can provoke our children to anger by just constantly criticizing them, giving them, offering little encouragement. We do it when we respond harshly, when we respond in anger. We do it when we are hypocrites, right? Uh, Do as I say, not as I do. And that could be anything from, well, you know, You really shouldn't swear, and then they go and hear us say something that we shouldn't say. Or or that you really, you you should forgive your sister, but then they see us not having a forgiving heart toward other people. Certainly my kids would say this about me, that we can do this by lecturing too much and not listening. Or how about when we embarrass them or we mock them or we degrade them in front of other people? And certainly there are others in that, that that we're familiar with as we see them in ourselves. And, and I think this is one of the ways where I, you can look at in terms of how this could apply to adult children is that sometimes we provoke our adult children to anger well, we don't let them be adults. Now, I'm not there at that stage of life yet, but I feel that at times when my parents come around. Sorry, Mom and Dad, if you're listening, but there are times when 
we don't treat our adult children like adults. We don't allow them to make their own decisions, to make their own mistakes. Kind of butt in on their marriage or butt in on health decisions or all these other things that kind of come into play. I know sometimes, you know, and I believe it when my parents say things like, well, you know, I'm still your mom, I'm still your dad, I still care, I want, and I need to learn to honor them and to listen to them and take things into consideration. But at the same time, as a parent, there needs to be a healthy boundary there of saying they are an independent adult and they can make these decisions. And certainly, as we go back to this, even seeing how this applies to obeying. Now, if, if our parents are asking us to do things that are improper or are against God's law, our obedience is first to Christ and to God and to his law and his standards. But even when there is something in there that goes contrary to that, that there is an honoring in that, and that even as parents, you would provoke a child to anger, you would exasperate them by asking them to do something that is improper. So, we as a parents need to learn that one thing we are to do is to avoid the kind of things that would have these negative responses by our children. But then it follows it up with not just something to avoid, but to something to adopt. So instead of doing this one thing to them, you're supposed to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And I, I do think the words bring them up, to me, that provides the context for understanding this, that it really is geared more toward younger kids in our homes. And as I said, you can see how it does apply to adults as well. But, but to bring them up, it's the same verb in there that, that is in chapter 5, verse 29, where it says that we're to, to feed and to care for, for one another. And to bring our children up in the training and instruction of the Lord is not just a physical and, and mental development, but more importantly, it's the spiritual and the theological development. And, and parents, it's not easy, right? And they don't always listen. And they do make their own choices. And it breaks our hearts when they don't go in the way in which you are training them. That's what we're called to do. And in our training, there are, there are rules and there are regulations and there are rewards and there are punishments. But we train our kids not just with what we say and do sometimes. But we can train our kids often with the things that we don't say and that we don't do. You know, there are, there are two extremes, I think. And, and sometimes we, we've all fit, those of us who are parents, can kind of fit into these two extremes. On one hand, there are parents who don't expect their kids, especially our ki their kids once they become teenagers, they don't expect them to come to church or get involved in youth group. They're like, oh, well, you know, they, they can make their own decision about things. But what are we teaching them when, when we're not expecting them to do that and to be a part of the body? We're, we're teaching them that the church is unimportant, that your time is better spent apart from the body of Christ, that sports or work or leisure activities are more important than Bible teaching and Christian fellowship. Well, that's one end of the spectrum. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you got parents who 
don't take time to teach their kids at home. They expect that everything that they need to learn for their spiritual development and their instruction in the Lord should come from the church. Now, that's why I send them to church. You know, that's why I send them to youth group. But the fact is that our kids, like us adults, might only spend a couple hours a week at church at best. But they're spending more time at home with us. And we need to own their spiritual growth and the development of our our children. We need to have times of devotion and worship at home. We need to be talking about the things of the Lord throughout the day, intentionally and conversationally. As Deuteronomy 6, 9 says, talk about these commands when you sit in your house so when you walk on the road. Talk about them when you lie down and when you get up. It's our responsibility to be training and instructing our kids in the things of the Lord. And it starts in the home. I like this quote from Vodi Bauckham. It says, Our children are not falling away because the church is doing a poor job. Our children are falling away because we are asking the church to do what God designed the family to accomplish. Like if we think that our children are going to grow up loving the things of the Lord because we send them to church, that's not going to happen because they're going to learn from what they see from us. They're going to learn what happens in the home. Earlier this week as I was was putting this together, I wrote down this quote, and I, I, I forgot to write down who said it, but I think it was Alistair Begg said, I think probably the reality is that in many cases that these young people are not dropping out. It's that they never dropped in. They were never in. They had never established or had established for them patterns of public worship. That this is the Lord's day and this is the Lord's house and that this is the Lord's word. And that these are the Lord's people. And that if I am the Lord's, then it would be very strange if I were to be abs- if I were to absent myself from the Lord's people, listening to the Lord's word on the Lord's day. And the fact that we may wrestle and fiddle and discover and rediscover is perfectly understandable. But it should be pretty obvious that that which they have never experienced is going to have to be an entirely new encounter for them when they establish their own principles. But if we don't model it in our homes, if we don't set that as an expectation, if we don't train and and instruct our children in the Lord, then they're not going to necessarily, it's not going to be easy for them at least to say, to establish those patterns once they become adults. Now, certainly God can get a hold of them in any way that he sees fit, and he often does. This is the responsibility of the parents, and more specifically, the dad. And I'm certainly convicted about that in my own home. It's my responsibility and direction that my kids are going. And certainly, Mom, if, if you see that Dad's not doing it, step up. And it starts in the home. Well, moving on, this, this next example...
This next set of relationships that, that Paul talks about here it is one that is, uncom- is uncomfortable for us because it dr- addresses something that many of us would rather wash over. It's slaves and masters. And certainly we don't like it because we know that it has been a source of great evil in our country and around the world. And we know that we're still dealing with the ramifications of it even today. We don't like it because we have a hard time reconciling how the Bible talks about slavery in the way that it does and how we often in our own common current sensibilities don't understand why it's not condemned outright. But I'll say this, Christianity's emphasis has always been on the transformation of individuals who will in turn influence society. Christianity has not been about the transformation of society, which will then transform the individual. But certainly in our culture, that's how we think it should be. It should start on the societal level. But God is always going after the individual. He's going after the heart. And of course, that's not to say that Christians can't use their social capital in the world. Because we should. And the Bible does speak to our role as as Christians, as, as followers of the true God, that we should be pursuing justice and mercy and humility. But here in, in these verses, Paul is just addressing the reality of the culture that they're in. That in this culture, there were enslaved people and there were free people who owned slaves. And Paul uses this social reality to make a theological point. That both the slave and the master are seen as equals in Christ. That both the slave and the master are part of the same family. And that both will receive an inheritance. So I'm going to take a moment, and I'll say this. I'm I'm not an expert in this area. Um, But just a a quick rundown of different types of slavery that that may have been people are familiar with or uh, understanding of it at different times. Slavery in Israel really was more like indentured servitude. Because there was no social welfare system. So the biblical laws tended to consider slavery as a form of a, a contract between persons. I think of it in this way. That it's like, you ever heard this where, you know, you, I don't know my parents used to say this all the time. Oh, my dad. Oh, my, Oh, I forgot my wallet. Uh, you know, we're out to eat. Forgot my wallet. Oh, I guess I'm going to have to go back in the kitchen and wash some dishes to pay for this meal. Right? Anybody ever say that or joke about that? Or Has anybody ever had to do that? No. I don't think so. But in some way, that is one of the ways in which slavery was considered within Israel itself. It's a way of, of dealing with Debts and labor and things of, of that matter. Jews were required to redeem Jewish slaves from non Jewish owners. But slavery was also temporary. Deuteronomy 15 talks about debt release and, and, and has the slave laws in there. And it establishes a seven year cycle of debt forgiveness and limits debt slavery to six years. As in the seventh year, slaves go free. That's the way it was in Jewish culture. Now, slavery in the Greco-Roman or Roman Greco world wasn't exactly just the same as that. 
And certainly there were abuses of it even in Jewish culture. But slavery in the ancient world uh, really could have been for anything. Could have been a mixture of debt slavery as punishments for crime, as enslavement due to being prisoners of war. Aristotle said that slaves were human tools. The Roman legal system gave slaves almost no rights whatsoever. And certainly that's the type of slavery that is, is here in this first century culture. Of course, most of us are, are familiar with, or when it comes to mind, we think of slavery in, in American culture, like chattel slavery, the, the social institution where people were legally dehumanized, that they were owned as personal property by an enslaver. That, like livestock, they could be bought and sold at will. And chattel slavery was usually the form of enslavement in most societies that practiced slavery throughout all human history. Of course, that hasn't gone away. Just read a stat this week that in 2019, so just two years ago, that there were still approximately 40 million people, about 10 million of them were children, but 40 million people who are enslaved throughout the world, despite the fact that it's still illegal and that it's illegal everywhere. And in the modern world, more than 50% of enslaved people provide forced labor usually in factories or sweatshops or in other ways. And certainly by human trafficking, it's the most common form of slavery in our world today. And so when we read this, when we come to this, we, we think it's hard to kind of wrap our head around because we're not living in a slave and master system right now. And so it's helpful for us to make comparisons as a way of just being able to, to apply this to ourselves, that we make these comparisons between employees, employees and employers. That we need to be clear that this passage is talking about slavery. It's talking about slaves and masters. An employee chooses by contract or by willingness to give his or her labor to an employer. And thus, that employee has options to continue his service or not under that agreement. The slaves in this passage do not share the same willingness to do the work. And that difference is significant and profound. Because it's one thing to say, work with a good attitude while you're at Chick-fil-A getting $9.50 an hour or, or whatever you're getting paid these days. It's completely another thing to say, work with a good, good attitude while you're under forced labor, while you're paying back a debt, while you may be working under rotten conditions and for no pay. God is suggesting in this passage to slaves and to masters a completely radical way of thinking. For a person who is enslaved, probably, possibly unjustly even, to work and to respond like this. To obey your earthly masters with respect and fear with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. So the motivation there is in verse 8. Verse 8. 
so that the Lord will judge everyone according to their work. Our job evaluation, our performance evaluation, our 360 or whatever you call it in your workplace, will be conducted by God himself. That's true for us as employees, and it was certainly true for them as enslaved people. That God is the one who's going to be looking at their work, not just their master. For sake of time, I'm going to go through this last little bit quickly, but it says, the instruction is to do it as to Christ. Do it with fear and trembling and sincerity. You're to work, even if you're working unjustly, with fear and trembling and sincerity. The second bit of instruction is to do it not just while they're looking. How often is our job performance improved when we know that our boss is right around the corner? How quickly do we turn off playing solitaire when the boss is walking by and and go back to working on our boring spreadsheets or whatever it is we do? The instruction is to, to serve well and wholeheartedly even when they're not looking. Another bit of instruction is is that we're doing the will of God, that we are slaves of Christ. And again, for sake of time, just wholeheartedly is serving the Lord. That's how we are to be working. And as a slave person, as an enslaved person, imagine how difficult it would be to be doing with that type of attitude. How much more is expected of us when in our jobs, we don't have the same kind of oppression over us. You know, it's easy to serve until you're treated like a servant, right? Um, Dr. Bill Bright, who is the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, is the ministry I work with, um, I was giving an interview, and the person who was doing the interview asked him, it's like, tell us about a problem that you face, something that the average Joe Christian can relate to. And Dr. Bright said, I, I don't have any problems. And this reporter said, come on, you, you don't need to over-spiritualize. You know, I know you're ahead of this big Christian ministry, but everybody has problems, so... Tell us one. And Dr. Bright just says, I don't have problems. And this reporter went on to basically ask this question in several different ways, trying to get him to to dump on some problem, just hoping that if he asked it differently, um, that he would kind of poke through Dr. Bright's uh, pious facade. But then Dr. Bright turned to him and said this. He said, I am a slave. I am a slave of Jesus. And a slave has no rights. The only obligation of the slave is to do whatever his master asks him to do. It's not the slave's responsibility to be successful only to be obedient. And so when we come to understand who we are and our role, that as a slave for Christ, that we can do whatever he asks us to do, and it's not a problem. Our job isn't to be successful at things. Our job is just to listen and to obey. Well, I don't really have time to really go into the master's part of it. But the master's employers, if you want to say that, but again, masters are to treat their slaves the same way. 
without threatening them. They are to treat them with respect and sincerity. They are to lead as if they're doing it for the Lord. And the motivation behind that is that they share a common master in heaven. That, that master is going to have his job performance review done by the same God who's going to do the job performance of the slave. And they're both supposed to be serving the Lord. So I'm just close with this. There's some questions on your note sheet and there are others, but God has called us to a radical way of living. You know, chapter 6 that we're going to actually talk about uh, in a couple weeks wraps up with the familiar armor of God section. It's because we are in a battle. And it's waged on different fronts. It's waged in our families and it's waged in our marriages and it's waged in how we work with one another. And a battle is never won when those fighting the battle are fighting against each other. And that it really is one as we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Father, I just pray that that you would teach us to submit to one another, that you would help us in our homes, that you would allow us to serve wholeheartedly as unto the Lord, so that you would be glorified and that others would come to know Jesus. So we pray this in Christ's name.